It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Ogden Reed, Jr. of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Paul Gray Hoffman, chairman of the advisory committee to the citizens for Eisenhower. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Hoffman, a week ago, General Wedemeyer brought to our viewers the latest word from the Taft camp. So I'm sure that our viewers will welcome you tonight to bring us the latest word from the Eisenhower backers. Now, sir, we've heard a great deal about these contests down south in Texas and Louisiana. As a first question, I'd like for you to tell our viewers uh, how you think these contests will be resolved. Mr. Chewy, I have great confidence uh, in the delegates uh, to the National Convention. And I think if these contests reach the floor of the convention, I think they will. I'm uh, certain uh, that the contests will be decided uh, in favor of the Eisenhower delegations from both Texas and Louisiana. Mr. Hoffman, what do you think the reaction will be of some of the Taft men in Texas to this whole question of contested delegates specifically, how do you think they will vote? Well, I, I think you'll find, uh, as, you, as we already have found, uh, certain men who, who are very strongly for Taft, uh, who are very strongly against uh, the tactics used in Texas uh, by some of the Taft people. So you think that uh, now there are about 75 votes that will be contested, aren't there? That's, 75 that's correct. delegates. And, and they will, the, the convention itself will vote on the seating of these rival delegations, won't it? Well, as I understand it, the, the National Committee will first uh, pass on these contests, and then uh, if there is a majority and minority report, as there perhaps will be, uh, the contest will go to the convention itself. And what you're saying, sir, is that it's your view that, that on the convention floor, that the Eisenhower case for those delegations will be so strong that you'll get the support of all the Eisenhower people, of most of the uncommitted delegations, and even a few of the people who, who, even fa who favor Senator Taft for the presidency. Yes, I'm quite sure that'll be the case. And uh, uh, that is uh, tremendously important, isn't it? That, yes. that, that fight will, will occupy a good deal of the early hours of the convention, won't it? Those 75 votes are very important. Would you say on the basis of what you now know that the chances are good that those contested delegates will be settled in the favor of Eisenhower at the moment? I certainly think so, yes, sir. Now, sir, <coughs> uh, I believe that it's been said by a great many people who've observed <coughs> the campaign to date that uh, there was some little letdown in, in confidence in for Eisenhower immediately after Abilene. Now, how tonight, sir, would you appraise uh, the way things are developing for the Eisenhower group? Well, I think the only letdown was on the part of a very few people he, who expected a miracle, who thought it would be all, everything would be all over uh, with just one speech. But uh, I honestly believe that every day uh, the case for Eisenhower has gotten stronger and stronger, and his position uh, has become stronger and stronger. What would you say, Mr. Hoffman, has, has hurt Taft, if you want to use that phrase? Do you think it's the argument advanced by the Eisenhower people that Taft cannot win? Do you think that argument has been chief amongst those that may have influenced delegates? I don't think that uh, the argument is advanced uh, by the Eisenhower people. Uh, I think that uh, the thing that has, has perhaps uh, given added strength is the fact that every poll uh, that's been taken uh, shows that uh, Taft just can't win. And uh, the time comes when uh, your practical politicians uh, begin to look those facts in the face uh, and begin to make decisions in accordance with the facts. Would you care to comment on Senator Taft's reaction to the latest Gallup poll? Well, I, I think his reaction uh, was a perfectly normal one, but I don't know any of the Gallup polls that have been over 3% in error in the past years. And I would say that uh, the characterization by Senator Taft 
of the, of the Gallup polls is propaganda, is something that uh, he probably didn't think through or he wouldn't have made the allegation. You yourself think that the, that the Gallup polls, uh, that report Eisenhower are much more popular, are apparently correct then? Well, I think that you've got to judge the present by the past, and I don't know any Gallup poll that has been an error over 3%. Mr. Hoffman, you, our viewers, of course, understand and remember that, uh, that you've had considerable experience in the field of foreign affairs yourself. Now, uh, what would you say is the principal difference uh, between uh, Senator Taft and General Eisenhower as candidates for the nomination? Well, I must say that I'm somewhat surprised at Senator Taft because it seems to me that in the foreign field he's adopted what I call Me Too. Me Too. Now, oh, are, I, you, I, are you accusing Senator Taft or stating that he's, he is showing some evidences of Me Tooism? As far as, as uh, following uh, the foreign policy of General Eisenhower is concerned, I, I can't uh, tell about Senator Taft's present state of mind. I don't know it. I do know this, that uh, General Eisenhower, by every action of his over the past years, has shown that he sincerely believes uh, that the security of the free world depends upon a collective security. He believes that we've got, the free nations must uh, stick together and work together, and he believes that down in the bottom of his heart. Uh, when I was in Washington, I never saw any evidence uh, that Senator Taft had any similar belief to that. Not that he is what we call an old-fashioned isolationist, but I will say there was a great lack of enthusiasm on the part of Senator Taft uh, for the programs that, it seemed to me, were most important and perhaps are responsible for having, uh, for communism having been stopped in Europe. Well now, uh, for those of us, uh, those of our viewers who want to choose uh, intelligently between Senator Taft and, and General Eisenhower, can you tell us this? Uh, what would be the principal difference in the handling of foreign policy? Uh, between Eisenhower as president and Taft as president. What do you think Taft would do that Eisenhower would not do in, in the foreign policy field if he became president? I think that it's, there's, a, some, there's a factor there that is somewhat intangible, but the whole free world has confidence uh, in Dwight Eisenhower. They have confidence uh, in his devotion to peace so that we'd start out, I believe, under uh, Mr. Eisenhower as president uh, with, with that conviction uh, which would help a long way toward reaching goals. You think the election of Eisenhower as president of the United States would give a psychological lift to the free world? I think it would give a perfectly terrific lift to the free world. What do you think, Mr. Hoffman, the reaction of the Russians would be to either Mr. Taft or Mr. Eisenhower becoming president? Whom do you think they respect the most and perhaps fear the most? Well, I can assure you this from very positive knowledge, that the Russian leaders uh, respect and fear uh, General Eisenhower. He's the last man they want to see made president of these United States. Now, on, on the, in the field of uh, domestic policy, uh, it's been said that, uh, or the Taft people feel, that General Eisenhower uh, doesn't, uh, is not critical enough for the present administration. Now, in the field of domestic policy, do you think that the two men, Taft and Eisenhower, are, are very close? I think that as far as policy is concerned, yes, you could say they're quite uh, close together. I think, however, that this point I'd like to make. We've heard a great deal about uh, answers to questions. We've heard a great deal about solving problems. As I see it, the most important step we've got to take is to improve the, the climate of the United States. Uh, the climate, uh, by that I mean this, that there has been too much fear, there has been too much hate, there has been too much amorality in the air. That's what we call smog in California. And I think we've got to come out of that smog and into the sunshine of goodwill and confidence and integrity. And I think that Eisenhower has a great deal to contribute in that respect. I think he will improve immediately the climate of these United States. It'll be a better place to yeah. live in. He'll give us all a lift. Uh, somebody has put it uh, pretty uh, crassly by just wondering uh, if Eisenhower will throw them out. Now, do you think if Eisenhower is elected president, he'll do a pretty thorough house-cleaning job in Washington? 
on the basis of Eisenhower's record. Remember this, Eisenhower has handled two of the most difficult undertakings in all human history. He organized and administered uh, the invasion of Europe. He's organized and administered shape. And uh, there, if you'll check the record, you'll find that he is completely impersonal uh, in his attitude toward people. He selects the best man he can find for a given job. No friendship enters into it. And I know of one or two cases where men deviated by what you might call a hair from what he considers uh, uh, their adherence to the highest possible standards, and they were on their way home in 24 hours. You don't think then that he would be guilty or of cronyism in Washington? I, he never has. That's the best answer to that. Let's to get back to the convention, uh, what sort of a, a campaign do you think Eisenhower will conduct in Chicago once he gets there? At the convention itself? Yes. Well, I think that uh, his that his con his convention activities will be handled under Cabot Lodge, mm -hmm. who has been his campaign manager, and under the staff that's been working with uh, Cabot Lodge. Now, two fast predictions I'm sure that our audience would like, sir. Number one, you're a Californian, and I believe you've been commuting back and forth to California. Now, how do you think that big uh, California delegation will split those 70 votes whenever they leave Governor Warren? Well, I'll tell you something very confidential. Uh, that delegation is composed of very, very smart people. Uh, I know most of them. As a consequence, I'll be disappointed if, when we least, at least 60 out of the 70 uh, don't go for Eisenhower. Well, Mr. Hoffman, it's been a, great, been a great pleasure to have you tonight, and thank you very much for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Ogden Reed, Jr. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Paul Gray Hoffman, chairman of the Advisory Committee to the Citizens for Eisenhower. July the 5th marks the end of the United States Olympic Trials of 1952. And the final exciting events are the important men's and women's track and field trials, as well as the decathlon, the rowing, the men's and women's swimming and diving trials. Now some 100 Longines Olympic timing watches, like this one, are being employed to time these trials, which are to be held in Los Angeles and Tulare, California, Worcester, Massachusetts, Indianapolis, Indiana, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and Flushing and Jones Beach in New York. Now, we are very proud that the United States Olympic Committee selected Longines watches to time all the events for the selection of the 1952 United States Olympic team. Every Longines watch, whether an Olympic timer for championship sports or a fine strap or bracelet watch like these, are just about the finest made anywhere in the world. Longines is the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from leading government observatories. It is, in truth, the world's most honored watch. Longines, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.